Good to see you back for the latest episode of Low Range. In this episode, we're visiting a place I know like the back of my hand, Cape York. And you know what? For the countless times I've been up here, we still manage to find places I've never been to before and find out things I never knew about the place. Amazing things. We meet a few Cape characters. <laughs> They're never too hard to find. Almost lose a car or two in the Wenlock, lose a photographer and even end up on a tropical island. All in all, an unforgettable trip. Sometimes I wonder where I would go if I ever got sick of it all and I wanted to live out the rest of my days in solitude, unbothered by anyone or anything. Back in the Lightning Ridge days, people used to call us Australia's largest unfenced asylum. People went to the ridge to hide, to run away from their previous life, to avoid other people. Cape York is another place like that. The history books are full of stories of hermits who lived out simple existences in some of the most beautiful places on earth. War veterans were common, although most of them are gone now. There are, of course, people who still choose to live up here on their own. Welcome to Australia's most, uh, uh, interesting campground. Charlie's an old miner. Well, I've got an affinity with miners straight away. And he's also a bit of a crackpot and a bit of a loner. I've got an affinity with that too, to be honest. Hello! We've got an electrician with us, Charlie. He's no good. No, well, you know this him is, already. This is a homework, <laughs> mate, yeah. you know? They always work, bushway, you know? Yeah, bushway. Yeah. First impressions of Charlie's mine was dirty old man living by himself, um, no thongs, just dirty, but he was a joker, a real joker. And you could tell he was a real hands-on type of guy. I come up t uh, 32 years ago for three months. I yeah. didn't want to see no bastard that I know, you know? It was nothing before. Yeah. And I, you know, you I liked it. it. Yeah, it was a bit of work. I stayed and uh, then I built it up, like, yeah. yeah he yeah. really had his own ideas on everything and nothing was going to shift him. And I liked him. Tony Abbott came yeah, up here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? And I was... You know, he, he rode his bicycle out here or something, he didn't he? He did. He did. I didn't recognise him. And I said, he's not a local. He didn't come off the road. And I said, <laughs> who the heck he is? When he coming up, took his head, yeah. his hard head out. The ears popped out like this, like a <laughs> donkey, you know? And I said, that's bloody Tony. And I said, oh, you like a cup of tea or coffee, Tony? Oh, he said, what are you drinking? I said, rum and coke. He said, I'll have one with you. I said, stuff you. I said, this is going too expensive, mate. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I put his name on the toilet there, you know? <laughs> the further we went into his property, you know, it, it came very clear to me that he had spent a lot of time building this place up. It was actual natural beauty. Oh, this is beautiful, Charlie. <laughs> A lot of work. Yeah, I imagine. Oh, wow. Geez, you drank a lot. They must look beautiful from inside. I suppose I wanted to see how Charlie was going because I wanted to know how I might have wound up if I hadn't left and, uh, and gone down to a real job because I imagine that's how I'd be. Pretty much like that. His property was something else. It was um, rustic, um, but it worked. It, it, it really did work. He had power. It was really good. The thing about Charlie, he's been living by himself. What that does to a guy, well, I can only imagine. But you could tell he was uh, he very well adapted. They reckon Cohen is the hub of the Cape. You know, it used to be the old administrative centre, but for me, Archer River Roadhouse has always been the hub of the Cape. It's always been on my must-stay list, whether I'm going up or down. It's kind of in the middle of where the Cape gets to be a whole lot of fun. And, uh, and I particularly like the people there. They're just really cool people. 
Cape York is a remote peninsula in northern Queensland, Australia. Cohen is about halfway up and Archer River's a little further north from there. From here we're driving 100 kilometres up to Development Road until we hit the turn-off for the Frenchman's Track. That's right, we're tackling the Wenlock and then the mighty Pasco Rivers. If we make it across then we'll head into the Aboriginal community of Lockhart before the final leg of our adventure, visiting a castaway on Restoration Island. When we rocked up to Archer River, a little bit of local knowledge, they let us know that the Cape had copped a lot of rain just before we got there. So I was thinking the rivers are going to be up, but when the rivers get up, they come down just as fast. So it was going to be hit and miss. We just had to go and find out. I was excited, really excited. Been here before, love this track. Had a lot of fond memories for myself. We spent a lot of time in the bush and um... I guess, if anything, that can make us more complacent than not. That first day on the Frenchman's, complacency ruled. Bit of a predicament here. We've lost our photographer. First I heard that Rob was missing, Joshy radioed through. Has anyone got Rob in the car with them? And I radioed back no. Everyone else radioed back no. The guys back out to the road, are they? Yeah, Mel and Gav have headed back out to the road, yeah. John went ahead a couple of kilometres. They had about five, six kilometres ahead. Uh, I went in between so we could get radio contact. So there was John, myself, back to Kenno, back to the crew cars, back to the main road, over a six kilometre stretch. No sign of Rob. Oh, this is not a good sign to discover I've taken the flares out of the truck. I started to think, gee, I wonder what's going on here, you know? And, and when you lose someone in your team, even if it's just for a little while, you start having all sorts of thoughts in country like that. There's snakes and there's spiders, and, and even though none of these things should ever stop anyone coming up the Cape, these are the things that go through your mind when you can't find someone. Far out. John turned around and headed back, but I stayed put where I was, and I radioed through to Keno to just stay in radio range. I was just going to go a little bit further than, than John had gone. Got me, Ken, eh? And I went probably another two to three kilometres further on. And lo and behold... Mate, you got a copy? I found him. You found him? It was Robbo, facing sideways, taking photos of leaves and wildlife. How you going, mate? Just sent out a search party for you. Oh, really? Yeah. I yelled at I'm going for a walk. Oh, did you? Yeah. Dude, do you have any idea what's been going on? Uh, when I was walking away, I just went, I'm just going to go for a walk. And I didn't know if anyone turned around, yeah. but I, I yelled, said it loud enough. Well, maybe I didn't say it loud enough. <laughs> when the Frenchman's track was first cut, it was dead straight. You know, it was obviously cut by someone in a little bulldozer going through the bush. You know, the telly track was like that originally too. But like all these tracks, people have driven around to avoid puddles and the track itself opens up room for erosion to come through and cut the place up big time. And that's exactly what we found. Before we even got to the Wenlock, we were driving from one side to the other, you know, taking the fresh bit to avoid a tree fall or a deep erosion gully or something. Well, uh, what do you reckon? Six, seven, eight k's to the Wenlock? Mate, yes. I uh, can't wait to get in there and taste the water. Oh, there's another bit coming up here too, mate. Just nice rock and rolly sort of articulation stuff. Well, during the wet season, the Frenchman's track gets washed out pretty hard. So you're crisscrossing tracks. A lot of articulation. Well, if your vehicle does articulate, that is. The 79 series um, is not the best with all that weight on the rear axle. I reckon we've got to cop a bit of this. Yes, there's been some water ripping through here. If anyone can get a van through this sort of territory, it's our Kenno. Most vanners would be concerned about towing if the track looked like this. Kenno's not, but if he knew what was ahead, he might be. Yeah, so we come across this other convoy that had 
been, uh, well, they only made it to the Wenlock, and one of the cars couldn't get through, so they had to hand winch it out. What a mission that is. Oh, we tried to get across the Wenlock. We come down here last night, yeah. and um, the Wenlock was like, it was about this deep in the middle, and I couldn't stand up. I, could, I was just getting swept off my feet. Just the winner, just up here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The guys had had trouble getting across with the patrol. They hadn't managed to. They'd only got about three quarters of the way, hit a sandbank, had to be pulled back. And they'd had a couple of goes, and that was as far as they got. Where'd this happen? The driveway at home. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Whoa. <laughs> and I guess I was thinking that we'd have to give it a go no matter what. But I was definitely thinking that for the first time in a while, I was going to be walking the Wenlock to check it out. It's not too bad. Oh, mate, it's roaring. It's roaring. <laughs> it's all, I roaring can, all I can see is bank, though. Yeah, look, well, this is where these guys tried to go. Through, through, and up. And you got to the other side. And you then. got to the other side. And, and see that water's moving real slow there, so it must be deep. When I first saw the river, I had to blink and look a couple of times, to be honest, because I wasn't really sure if this is where we should have been. It looked familiar, but it looked as if it had been shifted around a lot too, which is about when I put it into perspective. A couple of big wet seasons had really mucked it up since I'd seen it last. See, looking at this, I would have said, oh, this is it, it's just a bit different, but it's not. That's where we crossed last time. There is a track out over there. Well, that's where people have, that's, this is obviously, this is obviously like Mark II crossing. We've got you on radio, John. A little bit of right. I had to guide him through it just to make sure that he sort of didn't go into a couple of tree stumps. All right, mate, I think, uh, oh, that's sloppy. Milo being Milo, tracked it through, got down the bottom. Oh, <laughs> that's sloppy ass. Holy dooly. I don't think you can drive across a river and not be a little bit worried, you know? Unless you can see the bottom and it's 18 inches deep and it's just not an issue. When it's a river in flood like the Wenlock, when it's a river that's really hooting through some water, then you just don't know what's underneath, you know? You can have walked it a couple of times like I did. You still don't really know what's going to be there if you go two feet to one side. Why don't I try second? <laughs> Hey, stop smiling, guys. <laughs> you reckon I should put it in four-wheel drive? I'm not going to lie. My chick is racing a million miles an hour right now. I've got a line in mind, but I'm working off educated guesses here. I'll tell you what, at first, it uh, surprised me how much traction I had. She just kept going forwards, and I was, oh, I was just so pleased it did keep going forwards, to be honest. Damn, that was fun. Yeah, after seeing John go through, it was a little bit, you know, the 79 had proven to be a bit of a non-flex machine and it felt a bit top heavy with the height and everything with it. So I get a little bit apprehensive. So Glenn, a, you want to keep your left hand wheel high up on that bank and try not to take it off the ground like you just did. <laughs> so I crept into the, I suppose, entry, you call it into the Wenlock and I stuck to the left hand side, I wanted to. Kenno was calling me. Go left hand down what about halfway down? And Ken O started calling me left. Go left hand down again, about dropping a hole with your left hand wheel. I thought it was a little bit weird. I didn't say anything. I thought maybe he wants me to ride up on the bank just to, to take that angle out of it. But no, he says, no, your other left. Now hook left as much as you can. Keep hooking left. Not that way, the other way. Well, my right then. <laughs> it was just one of those classic cases of him looking at me and calling his left, which is my right. It put me in a bit of a situation there. They put the, the jack off into uh, a tree stump. Have a look on the other side, mate. No major damage, but it was really boggy as well, so, you know, I had to get winched out. Oh, oh, oh. Glenn might look calm, but I know how picky he is about his cars. He would not be happy right now. That's a big call for any winch, but the 79's pulled out easily. My turn to have some fun, I think. So I was driving up, and I saw what happened to John, saw what happened to Glenn. So I decided to take a different line. Yeah, that's a good line. Once I started that line, it came to fruition that that was probably the best line while towing a caravan. I wound the electric brakes right up before I started the descent. So I was hoping that they would just lock and maybe push the mud with them. 
How am I looking, mate? Mate, well done. Beautiful. You're going, you're going, you're nearly out. That was fun. As soon as Glenno drove into the river, all I could think about was that time up in the Gulf Country where his truck just sank into the sand. Go, go, go. Bring it now. Go hard. Whoa, that's getting deep, mate. Go hard. Yeah, we got out. <laughs> There's no Whoa. better feeling, I tell you. High and dry. That was awesome. Glenn had crossed. It was my turn now. Jumped in the truck. Hey, mate, you sure caravans are supposed to do this? No, I'm pretty sure they're not. <laughs> Started the drive, but I have to admit, I did have butterflies in my belly. Keno's made the wise move of preparing his recovery gear before the crossing. OK, you've gone out a bit further than us, but I think you needed to. The end was in sight, but then I felt the car start to float. Gee, it sounds tough underwater. <laughs> I know the Hilux is pretty well water sealed, but it's going to be getting wet in there. Clutch is filled up with water. When I did I flick that spool over? We are filling up. I was freaking out because I had all my good gear on the floor on the passenger side. Don't worry about the tree trunk. Don't worry about it. We're filling up. Where's that other tree trunk to catch on my roof? Don't worry about it. We're filling up. When your car's filling up with water real quickly, time starts going slow. I knew the guys were working hard on the bank. Everything I needed this trip was getting washed away. There's a lot of water in here. Finally, the guys had the winch hooked up. Yeah, I've got electrical smells and slowly I was winched out. I didn't need a lot. I grabbed traction again quite quickly. Left hand down! I just found myself in a real soft spot. I think there was a lot of sand built up there, a lot of water, and it just become like quicksand. Ooh. Oh, we have so much fun. <laughs> Don't we have fun, eh? Far out. I think we all learned something that day. And that is, if you're going to go for a wander in the bush, let someone know and make sure they do actually know, not just a passing comment. And also, keep your recovery gear at arm's length at all times. It's very important that you can just get something quickly when you need it. Sun was going down, you know, as we pulled out the last trucks out of the wedding, and there's nowhere right next to the river to camp. I knew of a bit of a flat country coming up, and that was really our aim. So from then on, everyone was looking. Glenn spotted the first bit of flat country with not too many trees. And that's where we camped. After a massive day, everyone was worn out. We're looking forward to a wholesome, bush-cooked meal. And that's exactly what we got. Well, after a day like we've had, absolutely fantastic. The last thing you want to find out at the end of the day is that while you were talking to people outside the supermarket, you forgot to pack a couple of the bags. But that's all right, because we're in the bush, so we can make things up on the run here. It's going to be like a fast recovery job. In fact, we've even got a name for it. We're going to call it Joshy Z Lamb. And uh, <laughs> Joshy Z is our number one recovery guy. All right. The number one recovery guy means we have to recover him the most. <laughs> <laughs> Over here I got some rice going because as you know you never go bush without lots of rice. It makes up for the stuff you lose in the car park. We'll just put that there. See how he mm, maintains it. Rock the hard. If you like your rice hard, it's really good. What was that, mate? I was just noticing how you maintain the cleanliness of the kitchen. <laughs> They're a joy to clean after you've cooked on them. Oh, they're absolute joy, <laughs> aren't they? Yeah. I'm gonna put some of this stuff in, it's called chili. Any objections? I've heard of I've heard about that stuff. <laughs> my knife's stuck in my pouch because it got wet <laughs> when we we're recovering number one recovery guy. <laughs> I was up to my neck in it. I'll just put a little bit of chili in Glenno. It's gonna be hot. And a little bit more later when we know that this is too much. Now while that's kicking along, I'm gonna put in the lamb. Now, all the meat comes from the butcher shop and it's all been cryovac Do you want that? Is it? I hope you filmed that. 
What's the rule on um, picking stuff up off the dirt? Five uh, seconds? Three-day rule. Three-day rule? Yeah, as long rule. as you pick it up within three days, it's good. Before I left, I mixed up some spices. There's nothing really tricky here. It's just some lime and some curry. It's actually the stuff um, that my local butcher uses to make all the marinated rissoles and things like that. And so I've been copying it because it's really good. I put some carrots in, some diced carrots, and uh, we're just about to take this recipe all the way. Here we go. This is oyster sauce. Why? Because I've got some. We already had some powdered mint in there, but now we're going to put some mint jelly. Why? Because I tasted it and it needs it. I need a bit of liquid happening in there. So I'm going to use condensed mushroom soup. There we go. And some water, which should just about fill up the pan. And then, to suck up that moisture, while it's all bubbling away, I'm just going to put in some dry peas. There we go. Oh, yeah, they're coming, out, they're coming out good. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're awesome. They just don't want to get into this meal, do they? Now I'm worried. The trick is normally to add it about, oh, you know, 10 to 15 minutes towards the end, and it'll suck up any extra moisture, suck up the flavour, and, of course, you get cooked peas in it too. Oh, well, that's good, John. Can you put some of them on the floor of my Hilux? Because it's a bit wet, <laughs> needs drying out. <laughs> suck up a bit of moisture, you suck reckon? Suck up a bit of moisture. Suck up a bit of moisture. Yeah, throw the peas in the floor <laughs> pan of the Hilux, because it's, uh, yeah, it's still leaking water. We could do that for you, Keno. Now, this is something I saw down at the shops. Actually, I saw it on TV. It's stand and stuff tortillas, and um, there they are. They're like little buckets. So I thought we'd try something different here. Guys, can you stand and be stuffed, so to speak? <laughs> Come on over here, bring your plates. Oh, it'd be my pleasure. <laughs> I knew you'd say that. Come on in. Let me put two there for you, Glenn. Look at this. This is just quite cute. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if this is going to work. This is probably a very silly idea, but there we go. We'll fill that up with oh, our... Oh, that is full. Guess what? This stand-up taco thing likes to lie down when you fill it right up. <laughs> <laughs> stand up and be stuffed doesn't quite work. Guys, stop laughing. Start I'm not eating. laughing. And mm. let me know if this is edible because, you know, it's thousands gone. of people are out Very there edible. going, did it work? Oh, it's good too. <laughs> Beautiful. You'd almost think I pay these guys to say that. No. There you go, guys. Joshy Z. Stand and be stuffed taco lamb shells things. Probably says on the bag you're supposed to cook them or something, man. I didn't read the bag. <laughs> judge cooking shows, I reckon, eh? <laughs> it rained a few times during the night. Very unusual this time of year, and, and I know it rained because the flaps were up on the swag, but um, I was a bit worried too next day because even though it wasn't actually raining first thing in the morning, there were some big black scuds floating around, you know? And it's not a good place to be between the Wenlock and the Pasco when there's a lot of rain. You can be there for an awful long time. Yeah, a Frenchman's track between the Wenlock and the Pasco is a lot of fun. You get everything thrown at you. get articulation, you get a few hill climbs, you get a lot of ruts, creek crossings, mud. Bit of a dip here, guys. Roger, a bit of a dip. Oh, that's probably just a high luck swallowing dip too. Oh, beauty, and a caravan swallower. <laughs> It'll take a lot to swallow that XT10, can I? Eh? Oh, go, okay. Glenn, eh? Oh, wheels in the air. Some of the angles Glenn gets on, it's like he's doing a mono up the track. The wet season is king of creating driving challenges. I love this stuff. I'm going the uh, front and rear e-lockers on this one because I just stopped. You're going to love this. Oh, 
They've just walked through with the lockers, but no chance without them. Glenno was cranking up some huge angles in the 79. He was hanging front axle in the air all over the place. I was just nervous wreck driving the 79 through those obstacles. I, I don't know how I didn't put it on its side, and I was just an absolute nervous wreck, and I was like, oh, this is not good. Not good at all. It's mangled there, mate. <laughs> I know. It uh, worries me at times, and I think it worries him too. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All I can see in my mirror is Gleno cocked up big time. Oh, I bet that felt good when it did that then, Gleno. Yeah, mate, starting to get used to it, eh? Yeah, this is caravan friendly, isn't it? Ooh, the caravan just lifted a wheel. Oh, go hard, Ken, eh? Oh, wow. That was good. Whoever created the Frenchman's track in the first place must have been very switched on when it comes to surveying. They picked the right spot to start it and end it, and they basically worked out that that terrain would be almost completely straight. I think as far as the whole thing goes, average speed would have been around 15 kilometres an hour, which is not a great deal. That's right. If you ever visit the Frenchman, don't expect to do it in a hurry. Even the straight bits need to be driven carefully. Sometimes you don't see the dips in the track until right on the last second. Oh dear, well, I remember this hole. This is where the creek crosses. I've been bogged here before. And in fact, I've been bogged twice here because I've been bogged further up there too, about 20 metres beyond it. So um, well, I guess hooking in is the answer and we'll see what happens. All right, mate. Well, if you need assistance on the other side, I'll be there to help. Well, let's hope I don't, mate. Fair dinkum. Ha ha! Whoa! That was all right! Let's see how the big 79 goes. I'm down. I'm down. You want to try a snatchy or you want a winching? Mate, it'll be a winch, I reckon. All right, I'm coming back, mate. Hmm. Hey, Glenn, this is really easy, mate. I don't know how you managed to get it so wrong. Sorry, mate, I'd get out, but I, uh, I'd fill the car up with water. How many dead snakes live in this log? We'll see if you can do this single pull. This will really uh, prove the worn. <laughs> oh, look at that, mate. Straight out. Wow. I'll come and grab the rope. We'll ask Glenno through, but we still need a Hilux and an XT10 on this side. And in Keno's typical fashion, he ain't taking no prisoners. She fell in. That was a big effort, but Glenn and I are back in the mud and we're setting up Keno's winch. All right, away you go. Only a little bit, driver. OK, hold up, hold up, hold up. I'll grab the rope so you can drive forward. That's it, we're through. I think the first time I saw the Frenchman's would have been 20 years ago on a trail bike. History is scarce when it comes to the Frenchman's track. A man named John Gordon discovered the gold fields at Iron Range in 1934. So the Frenchman's was probably built by a miner who wanted an alternative route into those gold fields. He was probably a surveyor, judging by how perfectly straight the track is a lot of the time. But was he French? Did all the effort he put into building the track pay off with his gold findings? We'll probably never know. <laughs> but I'm glad he built it. Mate, according to the VMS, mate, it's only Oh, probably 400 metres to the end of the intersection. Then um, probably another 1.2 kilometres down to the Pasco. All right, mate. Well, it's a few years since we were here last, but she was a bit one way after that, eh? I mean, that intersection would be the last place we could turn the trailer easily. Yeah, well, maybe if you duck down first, John, see if it's passable, because I'm not in the mood to do a 400-point turn with this van on. 
So John went ahead just to check it out for us. You know, Keno and I hung back, waiting for the radio call through, whether we could make it or not. Well, this is it. The mighty, mighty Pasco. I was a little bit hopeful on the Pasco. It looked like heaps of water, but it, as always, it felt really firm underfoot. It wasn't until I got halfway across the river and got knocked over that I just knew it wasn't going to happen. Not today. Yeah, I was disappointed, big time. That's twice this river's beaten me. I guess we could have given it a go, but pretty long odds, and at the end of the day, the payoff is sudden death rush down the river sideways. Especially in Milo, it's not exactly going to float away. At least it didn't take long to turn Milo around. Much. Glenno's Cafe. Oh, it doesn't get any better. At Cafe a la Glenno, we do poached eggs on toast, or poached eggs on rats this day, bacon. Um, we can pretty much do everything. I have the microwave, I have the stove, I have a barbecue, I have an oven, the coffee machine. We do the lot. Brecky's ready. It's like a real cafe, but in the bush. <laughs> what a way to lift the spirits. I was... Disappointment, yeah. Been here before. This is the second time that uh, John and I have made it to the Pasco and haven't been able to make it through. So knowing that we had to turn around, go all the way back, back through the Wenlock, and out, that part didn't excite me. We got back to the Wenlock and I'd noticed that within about 10 minutes, it was going down a couple of inches. And so we just plunged in. The soft stuff was at the entry for us now, not at the exit, so we had to dive off it. So 95% chance everybody was gonna make it through nice and easy. how pristine the water was in the Wenlock, so I thought, what better place to fill up the tanks in the caravan? Hmm, yeah, you couldn't ask for fresher water, can I? But that wasn't the real test. It was actually getting out of the Wenlock, back up into the main track. Oh, that was a beautiful little relaxing dip, guys. Nice, easy crossing. Um, I reckon we're ready to carry on. Just climb up this slope first, eh? Three ways out of the Wenlock now. One of them was totally impossible. The other one was the one we came down, which was just a slippery funnel. And then there was this steep track in the middle. Got those tyres gripped in nicely, mate. Mate, I love these tyres. They're just doing everything really well. Well, Milo got up it. Dead easy, as it turned out. The old e-lockers both ends and a few revs. Glenno, if you can get into that corner and get both your lockers on, you'll walk up there, I reckon. Up she comes. Leno got up it a little bit harder because he's dragging more weight. Woohoo! <laughs> the climb out of the Wenlock looked quite easy. John walked it, and Milo, and then Glenno walked it. But I had the extra weight on the back. But I thought I was going to be OK. But that all changed. Maybe the guys broke the surface. Oh, turn, baby. 
Uh, yeah. I persisted for quite a while before I went for the winch. Keno's backing up, and all I can see is the, the van and the, the back of his truck pushing up like this. Oh, seriously? Have you ever seen a ute in such a position? But I had to winch my way all the way up that hill. Well, we hooked up the winch to one tree just to get him around the corner. We got that done. Whoa! But then there was no trees to reposition him to to drag him straight up the track. So I reversed the 79 series back, we hooked onto that, right. and got him the rest of the way. What's he hooking that on? I can't see a thing. It's probably better that way, mate. Nice job, mate. Well, that's the Frenchman's completed. Off to Lockhart we go. Here we are, back out onto the main roads. Roads are beautiful, been graded, smooth as. A couple hour drive up the Lockhart. It's a beautiful drive through the Iron Range National Park, and the afternoon is a beaut time of day to be doing it. So I'm driving along, and I see a bloke on the side of the road walking. I'm thinking, who would be just walking on the side of the road up here, and where would they be heading? G'day, mate. How you going? How you doing? Keno. G'day, Keno. Brian. Brian, how are you? I'm well. Thought I'd just pull over and see why you're walking. Did your car break down? As it turns out, he's doing some great things. He's actually getting money together for the walking wounded, which is our soldiers that have been wounded overseas or at home to support them and their families. So we're walking and running, or I am, from the tip of Cape York, the northernmost point of Australia, to the southernmost point, which is southeast Cape Tasmania. So I don't think any human being's ever done it before and actually under human power got across Bass Strait. So when we get to Welsh Pool in Victoria, we're then going to kayak Bass Strait. Such a great bloke. You just got to love who you meet on trips like this. And I gave him a woofie to uh, take the Tassie with him and ride on the back of the backpack. So, uh, yeah, there's a little wolf heading down the coast quite slowly. need to know about Lockhart is that it's pretty much, it, it's, it's very much an artificial grouping. It's what's left of all the clans from all the, pretty much all that section of the Cape, all pushed into the one place. So it's no wonder that they don't always get along. But I tell you what, I've seen Lockhart in the old days and I've seen it now. And to my mind, there seems to be a lot more hope and a lot more good things happening in Lockhart than there are bad. Uh, I'm going to see if I can find a mate of mine who lives in town here. He's an islander and he knows pretty much everything that happens in Lockhart. And we need to find this bomb blast site. And I think the only way to do that is to find someone who knows everything that's going on around here. Excuse me, mate. Just further down. Hey, mate. The funny thing was that by the time we'd driven around, I'd met that many people that are kind of half new, and and then, you know, we wound up talking to half the town anyway. Hey guys, I um, got a bit of information from the locals there at Lockhart about this uh, Operation Blowdown. I think we should be able to find the site. Yeah, cool, mate. What's the story behind it? I think it's post World War II. Uh, the Australian Army trying to work out what sort of damage a nuclear explosion would do in the real world. Uh, but they didn't want to let off a nuke, so they let off 50 tonnes of TNT. Oh. And they did it here. I'd never heard of Operation Blowdown. Places you go to around Australia, there's history everywhere. And it was good that we found, that we sort out the history on this area in Operation Blowdown. Oh, oh look at this. I just felt this when I ran over it. And it's a great big hunk of, well, it's not, maybe it's not armour plating, but it's very close. Whatever it is, it's pretty solid and it shouldn't be here, which is a nice way of saying 
This is it. You know, there's a mound in the middle of this paddock that shouldn't be there. I reckon we need to have a look here, eh? Oh, guys, look at this. That's called a great big piece of steel. And, oh, there's more over there. So that's the frame of the blow. <clears throat> wow. Back in the early 1960s, America was going into the Vietnamese War. And the biggest problem they had was that they were fighting gorillas who used to hide in the jungle. Beneath a cloak of green, a tropical rainforest conceals many secrets. And I think something like 60 or 70% of Vietnam was covered in dense rainforest jungle. Exactly like this stuff rimming this site here. Now, the Americans were keen to find out what they could do to clear that jungle so they could get to the enemy. And so they experimented, or they wanted to experiment, with a low-grade atomic bomb that would clear the whole area. What effect would a nuclear explosion have on a tropical rainforest? But they approached the Australian government because they didn't have any rainforest like that other than Hawaii. And the Australian government said, yeah, 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 OK, yeah, we'll go along with it, but um, we don't want to use an atomic bomb. So to, to, to recreate that, they decided to use 50 tonnes of TNT. Authorities were unwilling to use an actual nuclear explosion, so an alternative had to be devised. And they built it to simulate an atomic blast, which means they built it into a tower right here. And into the jungle all the way around here, they had field guns and they had dummies representing people and they had, you know, other bits and pieces of apparel, all sorts of things, rain tanks, and then they exploded it. Arthur, request permission to commence countdown, over. Sun Ray, go ahead, over. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Well, I can tell you one thing that didn't survive, and that's the vegetation. It got shredded. This whole great big open area now is pretty much what that bomb took out. And there's corridors, you can see, where they cleared them with bulldozers and just left particular types of trees standing. This was a truly scientific explosion. And to come here now and to know this history and to find the actual epicentre. I'm sitting on one of the beams that would have supported that tower. This, to me, is just fantastic because, as much as anything, for a great big part of my life, I've been driving right past it. I never knew it was here. We're just surrounded by history in our country and we don't even know about it. Chili Beach has been on my itinerary for a long time, a long time, actually. And I've seen it change, you know, I've seen it become a national park and bollarded off and toilets and windbreaks and all sorts of other things. But a couple of things never change about Chili Beach. One is that it's always windy. Certainly it is when I get there. And the second one is that it's one of the most beautiful, beautiful places on Earth. So we're meeting up with Dave from Restoration Island. Uh, what's Restoration Island? I thought to myself, I had no idea. I thought just some bloke, a bit of a hermit, been living on a deserted island for 20 years. So this is old mate, eh? This is Dave. Yep. He's the original castaway. I'd sort of conjured up this mental image of Dave I, based on what I'd read and what a few people had told me and whatnot. And I figured we'd be looking for a real loner. Someone who really didn't like people. It looks like the boat's seen a couple of miles too. There you go, mate. <laughs> Dave, nice to meet you, John. G'day, guys. Yeah, Glenn, g'day, mate. How are you? When I first met Dave, he came in, I thought, <laughs> well, I thought this is Ruthie in 20 years' time. When I saw the conditions of the ocean, and we're supposed to be hopping on a boat, well, not a boat, a tinny, I was a little bit worried. And he was loading the boat up, loading the boat up. That was the part that I was a bit 
Is this guy got it together? So there we are, too many blokes in a leaky boat. We came around the point, and all of a sudden, there's the island. Oh, wow! When I first saw the island, I could see a, a yacht and a couple of shipwrecks. But when we were leading up to it, it's just beautiful white sand. It just looked perfect. If I ever get shipwrecked, this is where I want it to happen. Restoration Island was actually named by Captain Bly in 1789. You know, that Bly of the mutiny of the bounty fame. After some of his crew had mutinied and forced him and 18 other loyal crew members into a longboat, they spent 30 days at sea before landing on the island. In his diary, Bly wrote, this being the day of the restoration of King Charles II, and the name being not inapplicable to my present situation, for it has restored us to fresh life and strength, I named it Restoration Island. And it's on this white sandy point that they landed. It reminded me of islands in Fiji. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. First impressions were beautiful white sand, yacht wreck, little bar on the beach. I just thought, wow, if this is an island tropical paradise, I want one. I was jealous of his lifestyle. What he'd done to that island and how beautiful it was and how he had set himself up, brew his own beer. You've really perfected this homebrew, Dave. I've had a lot of beer in my life. This is beautiful. I've had 20 years of serious practice. <laughs> he wasn't some mad hatter living on his own who hated people. He was a really smart guy who decided that people didn't have much to offer him. Dave hasn't always been a bushy, far from it. In fact, he was once a full-on city slicker and a successful businessman. As luck would have it, though, when the share market crashed in 1987, his family's $10 million wealth was wiped out. He lost it all. And the family left, as, as they do in the modern world, and, you know, I'm out there uh, in a pretty tough situation. And, uh, you know, you've lost a lot of material wealth. And I look back and I think it's ridiculous. it doesn't mean anything now. But at the time, it was important. It would have been a big shock at the time. Yeah, losing well, it was, family, losing yeah, well, that's wealth. right. It's pretty tough. They, yeah, when the yeah. sheriff bolts your house down and and yeah. you pay the bank back a couple of million hard ones, yeah. and you got lots of debts, and the markets crashed, and you know life was hard, bloody hard. Yeah. And um, and I met a new lady. Right. She wanted the idea of, of no stress in life, and we yeah. talked about it, and she came up with the idea of what about an island? I said, well, that sounds like a good idea. So, you know, I ring my mate Bluey up. He said, Bluey, I need an island. I've got a new bird without a lot of money. <laughs> so I didn't have much. And uh, so here I am. So in your 21 years, have you had any sort of... Oh, yeah. Oh, damn, oh, it's all going to go... I've, I've had shape. a few difficult times. I've, uh, I got dragged over the oysters naked. and oh, cut, okay. cut, cut from head to toe. How did that happen? And I had two lines, and, and a mackerel line got caught on my... I, I, I tangled up with a big fish. Yep. And it literally dragged me across the oysters. Whoa. And I couldn't get it off. And, and uh, you know, I was hurt and yeah. bleeding and sore and, and I was in trouble. Whoa, what'd you do? Well, just rub myself up and down like sandpaper on the sand to get any bits of any oyster out of me. All I do is got a lot of cuts and I rang up a neighbour. Yeah. And I got some antiseptic and kept out of the water for a few days, for about yeah. a week, a couple of weeks. Yeah. And I recovered. What do you think the future holds now and how do you think you'll get there? I've got a connection with a lot of people in Lockhart. They want the island to work, and that's to build a healing and inspirational retreat here. Wow. It's worked for me. Why yeah. can't it work for others? What do you need? Backers? Oh, people and some financial help. Yeah. Because I don't have it. The lawyers have taken all my dollars. But, you know, I think there are people out there in the, in the planet that, that might want to come and have a look. You enjoy your life, though, don't oh, you? Oh, life, life is great. The first 52 years or the last 20 or No, the last 20 has been the best time of my life. And the next 20 or whatever, or 50 or, or whatever, yeah. it'll be the same. It'll be even better, you know? Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I loved every minute of this. I really <laughs> have. Thank you. You know what? Give me 10 years. That's me. Back at Cape York, been here many a time now, and I just love it more and more every time. Meeting up with people at the roadhouses, out on the track, that are doing the same thing that we are doing 
and to get the feedback that we're getting about what we're doing with low range and how the people are just grasping what we're doing and absolutely loving it and the smiles on their faces and how inspired they are by what we do, I get a real kick out of. It's not an ego thing, it's just a, it's an accomplishment thing. The Frenchman's for me was something that John and Glenn had done before, but I'd never done it. So I'm glad that I got the opportunity to actually go down there and see it for myself. And it didn't let me down. It threw obstacles at me left, right and centre, especially towing that XT10. It was a phenomenal track. That's got to be a bucket list thing, and so does Restoration Island. This trip covers ground I've covered so many times in the past, I've, I've lost count. And you know what? All it did was convince me that it's kind of like the beauty is in the detail. Dave and his island didn't even know they existed. The history of the bomb blast had no idea. The little kids at Lockhart had seen Milo in films. There's a certain absolute beauty in finding the detail in our country. And I guess that's what low range is all about. It's really doing it for me, I can tell you. Uh, hmm. Frozen. Get out, idiot. Today I'm going to drive Milo into the swimming pool on Sir Piano Bolt, and then I'm going to drive to the back bar, put it in the elevator, take it down to the health club, leave the truck there, go back to the back bar. Well, that was a lovely, relaxing little dip. I reckon we can carry on on the journey now, eh, guys? Nice to wash the cods. <laughs> that was great. Imagine all the people who are going to see this in disbelief. <laughs> no scratch is a good scratch, but if you had to have a scratch, I got that scratch. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. I can nearly get my finger out that crack now. It's not actually a crack, it's just that the door's bent. At least I hope it's the door that's bent, not the car. Get into character. Hello, Ding. Hey, Ding. We should go a hole. Brilliant. All I need is a little umbrella to put the chairs around it. Has anyone seen Wolfie? I don't know where Wolfie is. How did you get connected with Restitution Island? <laughs> restoration. Well, Restoration. Restoration, not, not, uh, not revolution. <laughs> I'm the king of the world. Get off my ship, Asmine. Mate, that was sloppy. Gee, I must be on an angle. Wow. <laughs> hey, mate. G'day, mate. How are you going? I'm good, you? Good. You're walking past. No, we're doing it here. What's on the menu, Glenn? Uh, defrosting chicken things. On a barbecue. On a barbecue. Rolling, hello. I <laughs> bet you didn't expect to see me here. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness gracious me, that was just rollicking fun, chaps. Yee, you there, excellent. At hand's length. You need to, you need, it's not hand's length, it's arm's length. You okay? <laughs> Gonna make some noise. <laughs> My first impressions were with the pre-pre. Um, da-da-da-da-da-da, the end. <laughs> <laughs> 